everyone, and thank you for joining us. For this program, Kingfisher Tales with Marina Ritchie. I'm Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the programming team at the Deschutes Public Library, and every single month we explore a theme with our programming, and this month's theme is Origins. To find more free programs, check out our web calendar for the most up-to-date information, because a lot has changed for January, at deschuteslibrary.org forward slash calendar, or you can go to our YouTube channel and find recordings of programs like this one. If you have questions that come up during the program, please use the Q&A and we'll have her answer them at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Marina, for sharing these Kingfisher tales with us. Our presenter is Marina. She's an author and nature writer who lives here in Bend. She's the author of the forthcoming book, Halcyon Journey in Search of the Belted Kingfisher. Well, thank you for that introduction. And I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen um, right away so we can get into this beautiful first slide. Hopefully there, second, there. Okay, then less of me, more of the Kingfisher. So I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. And this is was one from, it's from COCC, Central Oregon Community College, did a wonderful job. And so I'm, I'm going to share that. I am presenting in Bend, Oregon on the original homelands of the Wasco and Warm Springs people who are still here today and are thriving members of our community. I acknowledge and thank the original stewards of this land. So thank you for coming to Kingfisher Stories and thank you, Laurel, for the introduction. I wanted to add a little bit more about my adult trajectory that was started in Oregon, going to University of Oregon and Oregon Institute of Marine Biology and majoring in biology. And I ended up though over in Eastern Oregon for a few years and by sort of random chance, I was always a writer. I became a reporter for the Blue Mountain Eagle for a few years. And then I decided I really wanted to learn more. And I got my master's in journalism over at University of Montana in Missoula. And I lived in Montana for many years and my journalism career spanned all kinds of different things, including a couple children's books and running the Sage Grouse Initiative and Mm, all kinds of things, including interpretive signs, which I, I do today still, and you can see some of those on the Oregon coast. So I'm also a board member of the Greater Health Canyon Council. I have a real affinity for Northeast Oregon, where I did my master's thesis years ago on environmental controversies there. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get right into our program stories that's what you want to hear and you can see here the bird of happiness or halcyon days over here is a common kingfisher this is not a bird that lives in north america but over in europe and in greece because this is a greek myth and in in fact the common kingfisher has a span that goes into northern africa and over into asia and over here on is our with the funny crest bird is our North American belted kingfisher. This is a cute little juvenile looking up in the air by photographer Charles Wheeler. And we will be hearing an indigenous myth. And at the end of the program, I will have some time to give you some tips on where to find kingfishers in winter. Um, I am going to be reading a, a bit from my book, The Stories, so I'm excited. This is more than a decade in the making, my halcyon journey in search of the belted kingfisher. I'm pleased to have some advanced endorsements, and I'm very happy with Oregon State University Press. I'm going to mention, too, this cover photo. I think it's this beautiful, classic kingfisher by a very professional photographer, Brian Small. So, I uh, particularly excited about having David George Haskell uh, write about my book and I'm a big fan of his and he actually has a new book coming out that's called Sounds Wild and Broken just came out. So the book itself is threading natural history, my first person adventures, memoir where it's relevant and mythology and stories, which is what we're gonna take, talk about this evening. So I am going to not say too much more about the book itself, but I will say that it's illustrated by the wonderful artist from Newport, 
here in Oregon, Ram Popish. He was also very funny, as you can see. And he had did 16 illustrations for the book in the common kingfisher uh, that will be hearing the story of Halcyon Days. It's rising out of the water, looking quite magical. And then there's a couple of belted kingfishers in flight in full on chase, which happens quite a bit. So before we settle in, though, I thought it would be good to have a little sense of kingfishers. And I know a lot of people are surprised to know there's this many species in the world. 120 is the latest tally. And you can see from this poster a sampling of just how radiant and colorful and spectacular they are. And they do share something in common. They tend to have these rather big heads, disproportionate for their body, and those dagger bills, which aren't always for fishing, because some of them, like the kookaburra in Australia, you know, they'll just they live on in land and they are going after lizards. So, but here in oh, and there's one other thing, the tiny feet. That's another thing you can't really tell. But these are not birds that are going to stalk around like robins in your yard. They have little feet, but they're great for digging and excavating because these birds dig an earthen nest or some of them nest in termitariums or in trees, but they, they are an unusual nesting bird and those tiny feet are like little shovels. So here, our North American belted kingfisher is really our only species. It's surprising when there's so many in the world, but down near the Mexico border, you will find the ring kingfisher, a diminutive green kingfisher and the Amazon kingfisher. The stories, every kingfisher has a story. They sometimes are humorous. They're often powerful because these are such angling birds, such pros, and they can be transformational, but each one is place-based. For me, my whole start of this book began back in 2008 when I first opened up the word of the day and on my laptop and I read Halcyon, now I knew the definition of Halcyon, I thought, you know, number three and four is calm, quiet, peaceful, happiness, peace, prosperity, it's a pretty good word. But I did not know one and two, that Halcyon, the noun, is a kingfisher, a mythical bird, number two, identified with the kingfisher that was stable to nest at sea about the time of the winter solstice and to calm the waves during incubation. Well, I thought, and here we have the Greek, the, the kingfisher of the Greek myth on the left, I just thought, wow, put those together and I'm a bird lover to begin with, pursue a bird of happiness, I am in. And so with that, I'd launched into following this bird, not knowing how finicky, secretive, exasperating, frustrating, this, the kingfisher is not an easy bird to follow, but that makes happiness all that much more special when you find it. So this evening, we're gonna be gathering around, pretending we're gathering around a fire because winter is for storytelling. Especially in the indigenous peoples, this is the time they only told stories. And in fact, I have this little excerpt from the book from uh, a Salish story that I'm not gonna tell tonight, but I liked what she said. Uh, before Ellen Big Sam began, she warned that if winter tales were spoken after the snow melted, a snake would wrap around the leg of the storyteller on a walk. So I, uh, I think we're in good shape since this is January. So we're going to begin, though, with the far across the sea with the myth of Halcyon and CX, the origin of this word Halcyon, the origin of Halcyon days. And I, I do like this painting. Um, because the artist has shown Halcyon, who is looking quite bereft, and we'll find out why, but she's dressed in the colors of the kingfisher, the common kingfisher, the one we don't have here, but those beautiful turquoises and ambers. And you can see above her are a couple kingfishers flying. So we'll find out about her distress now. I'm going to turn to reading out of my book and I had researched the myth. I got very interested in this kind of little known Greek myth and found it in all kinds of places. But the, the one I liked the best was in Ovid, the Roman poet's metamorphosis because it's a bigger story there and also poetic. But then I kind of mixed it in with others and my own embellishments. And this, what I'm gonna to read to you is uh, 
a little bit of a loose translation with apologies to the great Roman poet. He didn't mention kingfishers. I do. Okay. Halcyon, daughter of Aeolus, god of the winds, fell in love with Ceyx, son of Eosphorus, Lucifer, the morning star. Their love was rare, the kind where souls, spirits, and bodies entwine. They married and lived in harmony in the way that Ceyx reigned the kingdom of Trachis. But all was not well. Ceyx had a brother named Dathalion, who was as warlike as Ceyx was peaceful, except when it came to his daughter Kione, whom he adored. For Dedalion, life dealt a crueler fate in sharp contrast to Ceyx's joy. Kione's ravishing beauty attracted two suitors in the form of Apollo and Mercury. After she bore twins, one from each god, Kione boasted that her stature rose higher than Artemis, goddess of the hunt and sister of Apollo. Infuriated by this act of hubris, Artemis killed Kione. The bereft Dedalion threw himself from the cliff of Parnassus. As he fell, Apollo intervened. Dedalion's arms became wings, his nose a hooked bill, his toes curled into talons. Once fierce as a human, he flew as the predatory hawk. When CX learned all that had happened to Kione and his brother Dedalion, he grieved and grew fearful. The tragic loss of Kione combined with his brother's fate could well portend trouble for the tranquil kingdom. Ceyx approached Halcyon, telling her he must consult the oracle of Apollo at Delphi and go by sea since the overland path was then impassable. Halcyon warned him of the dangers of turbulent winds, which she knew well from her father, Aeolus. Ceyx held her close and told her he would be careful, but that was not enough for her. Please take me with you, she begged. I cannot, I must go with my crew while you remain safe on shore. No, together we will face the danger of the storm. Ceyx listened and his love burned strong. He promised to be home before two full moons had passed. They kissed and their bodies melted into one another as the waves broke on the sea. Halcyon watched the ship set sail. Her tears flowed as her vigil began, walking the shore day upon day. Her waist-long auburn ringlets blew in the salty wind. Halcyon's turquoise dress rippled with the colors of the Aegean Sea. Often she cast off her slippers and ran barefoot splashing in the foam. Once she saw a kingfisher hover above the ocean. She held her breath as the resplendent bird paused in mid-flight, even as her own flight felt on hold while the love of her life sailed far away. Ceyx and his crew glided halfway across the sea toward their destination. It was then as night fell that white caps foamed on the waves, a southeastern wind blew and soon became a gale until the sea churned in fury. The captain called out to furl the sails, but the violence of the storm swallowed his words. The ship rose high to teeter on the summit of the looming waves, then crashed into the valley depths, only to climb once more. Rain poured, thunder boomed, lightning struck, water gushed into the vessel until the crew wept and called out for their families. Ceyx had one word on his lips, Halcyon. Without warning, a giant wave broke upon the ship, shattering the rudder and the mast. The splintered boat sank into the depths. Ceyx, one of the few torn from the vessel instead of trapped upon it, clung to a plank and spoke Halcyon's name one last time as a black wave curved down on him. Before the dawn lifted the gloom of darkness, the morning star dimmed in grief. Meanwhile, Halcyon walked the sands and prayed at the shrine of the goddess Hera that Ceyx might come home safe to her. Hera, wife of Zeus, listened 
to Ahasian's entreaties, yet even she could not change his fate. Hera sent her messenger, Iris, goddess of the rainbow, to the cave of Somnus, god of sleep. The glimmering Iris woke Somnus to ask if he would command Morpheus to take the shape of Ceyx and appear in a dream to Halcyon. Somnus lived with his three shape-shifting sons. Isolos represented four-legged creatures, birds, and snakes, while Phantasos mimicked soil, rocks, waves, and trees. Only Morpheus could take the form and even copy the pattern of speech and movement of humans. Somnus agreed, Iris retreated before she too might succumb to the somnolent cave of deep dreaming. Morpheus then flew to the bedchamber of Halcyon, who woke to the specter of her Ceyx dripping wet and pale. She cried out when she saw him as he told her he had drowned. Queen Halcyon ran to the sea, tears streaming, Hera and Zeus, in their pity, made sure the body of Ceyx would wash up on shore, where Halcyon could at least enfold her king one last time. When she saw the body of Ceyx rolling on the incoming waves, she climbed up a rock jetty and leaped to join him in death. As Halcyon fell, Hera and Zeus changed her into a kingfisher. Her leap became flight, and she cloaked Ceyx in her soft wings, touching his face with her horny beak in the only way she could kiss him. It was then that the gods transformed Ceyx into a kingfisher as well. The two birds flew away, feeling the newfound freedom and the love no longer bound by gravity. Each year they nest upon the sea over the winter solstice when Iolus, father of Halcyon, lulls the waves for seven days before and seven days after the solstice, the time when the kingfishers brood their young upon the waters. And that's the myth, but they're in reality, myths are myths. There's some truth and there's some fiction. And indeed, this is where common kingfishers nest. This is a cutaway. This would be deep inside a tunnel in a burrow with these cute little eggs. And, uh, but it could well be that the ancient Greeks did not know where kingfishers nested. It's, you know, a lot of people don't. They're like, why aren't they in a tree with a stick nest? And so needed a story to explain the origin of kingfisher nesting. And they also had noticed a real true phenomena, which was these winds tended to calm at a certain time at solstice. So this became an explanation for that. And, Indeed, uh, Pliny the Elder, a Roman author back in AD 23 to 79, also a naturalist and philosopher, he explored a lot of natural history in his encyclopedia, Naturalist Historia, and he actually talked about both these winds and the fact that the kingfisher nesting on the sea, he even figured out where they might have nested. He described their nests as a uh, a ball slightly projecting with a very narrow mouth resembling a very large sponge. And indeed, there is some kind of coral sponge that floats out there. It is not the kingfisher nest, however, but it's part of the story. And since then, thanks to this beautiful romantic Greek myth of transformation, we have a lot of halcyon references in literature, including Walt Whitman, Leaves of Grass, then for the teeming, quietest, happiest days of all, the brooding and blissful halcyon days. And then some like John Keats and Endymion mentions the Kingfisher, O magic sleep, O comfortable bird that broodest o'er the troubled sea of the mind. Of course, Shakespeare, Talks about Halcyon too, expects St. Martin's summer, Halcyon days since I've entered into these wars from Henry VI. But surprisingly to me, I was really shocked when I found out that the original lyrics to America the Beautiful were, oh beautiful for Halcyon skies. Who would have thought that? So with that, I'd like you to think as I transition to our next story about the belted kingfisher, what kind of memories bring Halcyon to mind? Where do you find tranquility 
And for me, I often find it, of course, uh, by wild waters and the presence of kingfishers, also in wild ancient forests. So let's turn now to our bird of North America, an indigenous story. I will say there's a true connection in the Latin name for the belted kingfisher, Megaserl alcyon. And Megaserl means big blue, that's the genus and all the megasterls have these crests and they're also crazily far apart from each other. That's in my book too, you'll have to find out. But the species name, Alcyon, is a Greek name, a Greek spelling for Halcyon. So indeed, they are connected. But, and uh, here we have a uh, very uh, wet looking belted kingfisher. And I will just say something about this photo before I go into the story. You'll notice that the, this is a female that she is holding the, the fish so the head is extending out, right? And now if she was going to eat that fish, she'd flip it around the other way because you only want to swallow it head first because the, the spines on the, on the fish would then lay down smooth and they wouldn't catch in her throat. So this means she's going to feed this. Indeed, I know that because I knew this with, about this photo. She's going to feed this to her very hungry chicks that are inside the burrow. When I read this story to you, I'd like you to have another chance to appreciate Ram Popish's sketches that are in the book. And you can see the crest that can be slicked down from diving in the water or the wind or, oh, and it's typical raggedy two-parted way as well. So I'll keep this up while I read a shorter story than the last one, but this is also in my book. And note that I, in the book, you'll see that um, there's some places where I'm just summarizing the story and then a few places where I've got the actual words from the book I took this from. So I think I can tell you, I will try to sound like, you know, the, you'll tell, you'll know the difference when me narrating the summary and then the actual part of the book. Old man or nappy stories of the Blackfeet nation honor old man's role as creator and offer morals through his many pranks. Why the Kingfisher Always Wears a War Bonnet appears within Frank Bird Linderman's 1915 book, Indian Wise Stories, Sparks from War Eagle's Lodge Fire, a lively collection of tales told to him by elders of the Blackfeet, Cree, and Chippewa people who trusted him as an ally and advocate. Linderman created a fictional storyteller, War Eagle, based on a close Chippewa friend and medicine man who regaled his grandchildren with stories of the animal people on October nights after the first frost on the upper Missouri River in Montana. War Eagle began with a hook to capture the attention of his curious young listeners gathered around the lodge fire. You have often seen Kingfisher at his fishing along the rivers. I know, and you have heard him laugh in his queer way, for he laughs a good deal when he flies. That same laugh nearly cost him his life. According to the story, the fateful event took place on a bitter snowy day when old man and the wolf hunted. They were hungry and had traveled far looking for meat. Old man grumbled at their plight. At day's end, they came to a river where four fat otters played. When the wolf told old man he would catch an otter to eat, old man warned him not to head out on the treacherous ice, but the wolf did not listen. He skidded after the otters. Nearer and nearer ran the wolf. In fact, he was just about to seize an otter when splash into an air hole, all the otters went, ho, oh, the wolf was going so fast he couldn't stop and swow into the air hole. He went like a badger after mice and the current carried him under the ice. The old man cried and wailed as he ran down the riverbank, hoping wolf would emerge where the waters flowed out from the ice. Instead, he found Kingfisher balanced on a birch limb, laughing at him. That made old man angry. He threw his war club. Kingfisher ducked and the club raised his head feathers so they stood up straight. War Eagle ended with old man saying, 
I'll teach you to laugh at me when I'm sad. Your feathers are standing up on the top of your head now, and they will stay that way too. As long as you live, you must wear a headdress to pay for your laughing, and all your children must do the same. So that is the origin of the Kingfisher's crest. And from that humorous story, I'd like to share a short, an even shorter one, um, that's truly an origin story of people. And I wanted to also say that this particular story uh, had a lot of meaning for me as I look to the Kingfisher as a helper in the way to cross obstacles in my life, either searching for the Kingfisher in my personal life. So with that, also from the book, without the help of the Kingfisher, the Arakara people of the Great Plains would not have found a better world. To journey westward from a hiding place underground after the creator sent floodwaters to eliminate giants, Three birds help them overcome obstacles to reach a better place, a kingfisher, an owl, and a loon. Coming to a chasm, kingfisher reshaped the earth and laid down an enormous beak that served as a bridge. With a great flapping of wings, owl cleared a thorny forest and fast flying loon parted a lake. The people could choose whether to continue or turn into the bird that helped them. A kingfisher, I'd be tempted. So that's that story. And closer to home, I just wanted to add a little something from my friend, David Liberty, who lives in by the Columbia River and Hood River. And he wrote to me about why the kingfisher is special to the Umatilla people. The kingfisher was sure to impress a tribe of fishermen. It was that skill or power to catch fish that the locals wanted. A good fisherman was highly regarded. If one could capture the power of a kingfisher, it would increase your chance for success. The spirit of the bird from which you got the feathers is honored in hopes of gaining its assistance. I like that. So I often look to the kingfisher for that. So maybe after just a few little tantalizing things and stories, you too may want to spend more time looking for kingfishers. And I imagine quite a few of you already know where to find them and, and kind of and quite a bit. But for those who don't, I'm going to give just a few things, tips for finding them in winter, um, where we are. And you could be living locally here in Bend. I have some specific things, but no matter where you are, in North America, if you're listening, um, you can find the belted kingfisher where there's open water. And certainly the, the kingfisher is right on the Oregon coast. And I've had amazing encounters on Coos Bay. Uh, so, and the thing about winter is the birds are not as tied to a, a territory for a nest and raising young. And instead they can range around a bit and you know move away from ice or find better fishing but they what you won't find them doing is flocking together they just don't they really don't except with their mates in and their fledglings and even then they don't spend that long before the fledglings are off on their own so they're solitary they're secretive but you look for them um they've got to have a perch you know so they can have a good view to fish near the water. So in this case, this is a photo by my friend Ken Miracle over in Boise. And you can see the, the tricky thing about kingfisher finding in winter is that the snow, for people who have snow, can disguise the bird a bit. Because normally I would say, look for white. You know, like look for the white ring on the neck and that white, this is a male, the white chest, and it kind of stands out in a, 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 against a tree, but not so much in the winter, I will say. However, they'll be, they sometimes are right up on a wire across some water where they can look straight down, or they might even land on a boulder too. So that's, that's a little bit about where to look. I had to put this in, you know, this has been going around social media and it's a bigger poster than this, a non-birder's guide to backyard birds. They are indeed J-sized, I would say, but notice the tail is a lot shorter than a real blue J. Uh, but right in here, I just thought this was pretty hilarious. Blue J, female blue J, another blue J. Um, 
So, because I, I do refer to them as J size, but the clever person who did this also riffed on this thing of, of their having a reversal of their colors from what you would expect for the gender. Because indeed, that female blue jay is a male belted kingfisher. And that's the female belted kingfisher because they have this strange reversal where she wears the belt, which I kind of like, and something I pursued a lot in the book to find out why. So they're also not a backyard bird, really. And they're loner, they're territorial, they're noisy, and they are awesome anglers. So the first thing, and you've heard about the, in the story about the, the laugh of the kingfisher, this is really what you're going to hear. And I, I'll play this. So that's a classic rattle of a kingfisher. They have variations. They can be even louder than that, or they can be softer than that, like a little conversation. But kingfishers tend to be a bit chatty. And it's a little like a squirrel, a little like a rattle, but I think it has sort of a birdie thing about it. And this is a classic photo too of their flight pattern, something else to look for. And they often uh, rattling while they're flying. And low to the water is classic. And you can see these beautiful wings dipping down as if to scoop the air below. That's um, again, Ken caught that just right. And something else I've noticed, and you might notice when you we look for kingfishers, is when they're looking around and they're kind of casual, like in this one, he's got already got a fish and sort of man, not going too fast. Put their head, he puts his head up here and he's looking around. But I've also seen kingfishers just put their heads just in total line with the with their body and just turn into these rockets and they can fly so fast. Um, so, and it doesn't mean they're always low to the water. They can sometimes be overhead, going tree to tree, but listen for that sound. Now, how the heck did, did this kingfisher catch that fish? Well, we do know that, the, that, that he is having a hard time holding on to, that's one big fish, that was really a big fish. And he's like, yes, can I do this? But the way he caught it in the first place is something that I do go into in more detail in my book. And, and there's a lot to it. They are just magnificent anglers and they can hover, which is very unusual for a fishing bird this size so they, and keep their head completely st uh, still while looking down at the water below and you know with incredible accuracy see a fish just below the surface and pick out exactly the one they wanted um, and when they might dive from from this hover or from at an angle from a perch or on a wire but it's always head first and that's stunning too to watch so I never get tired of it and I know you'll probably enjoy that too so but in this case, this is sadly what happened to the kingfisher's fish dropped. I can almost seem like saying no and wait till he tells his friends all about the size of that fish. So uh, with that, I want to just, just talk a little bit about some specifics nearby for those of who live here. And I'm sure you can talk among your friends if you're not here about where, you, where to find a kingfisher. Again, you don't find them in flocks, you know, <laughs> you really don't. So I happen to know at this moment, I regularly see one in Bend. Um, Meadow Camp is, is an access where a lot of people go down river with their dogs and there's one male, that's, he's a juvenile. He's been hanging out, rattling a lot. And then downtown in Bend, there's several places. Um, Farewell Bend, the Bill Healy Bridge, just down river from that. There's a footbridge right around there. There's a lot of waterfowl right now, beautiful. And there's also a kingfisher. And that they kind of patrol about a mile of half mile, mile of river for fishing. And so that's definitely a good spot. So is Sawyer Park, where a good friend of mine also, uh, sees a, a belted kingfisher every day because she lives right there. And then First Street Rapids is another good fishing spot for kingfishers. Now, I do have a female kingfisher up here in the corner as my little emblem, but I wanted to say that in more northern climes or less, or less, and I'm seeing females in the winter, but in places like Montana, a lot of the belted kingfisher females do migrate in the fall, 
in the late fall and they spend the winter south. Some of them will even go all the way to Mexico and uh, they just have a good old time while and then come back in early spring to find to reunite with their past mate or to find a new mate. Whereas the males do stay. And that can be to make sure they're guarding these precious earthen nest banks where they nest. And there aren't that many good nesting spots. It's a real limitation. So um, I think that uh, I do have a female here, but they aren't always around, but I definitely have seen some here. So with that, I'm going to bring this to a place where we can have some questions. I just wanted to say that I really believe that myths of transformation of people to birds and the stories that link us to animal people help us find our way. They, they are kin with the animal people. They bring joy to us and community. And I believe too, that the more connected we are with the natural world, with all forms of life, the more we care and the more we will act on their behalf. So with that, you can see a little bit more from my book and I'll just read the last part. To be alive is to immerse in our animal selves with every head first plunge, the bird of transformation calls us to be bold. I'm going to end with this slide so you can have some links. I wanted to say that Oregon State University Press uh, does have um, a write-up and reviews on their online catalog for the forthcoming spring books. And that I also wanted to mention this, that um, I have my website and blog here under my name. And if you want to send me an email, this is my email address, just has a one after Marina Ritchie. And the, I have for my friends, and I'm considering all of you friends because you attended, that uh, I have a special flyer with a 20% discount for pre-orders and free shipping. So I'm happy to send that to you if you wanna send me a note. So with that, Laurel, I'm ready for you to wind it up for us and bring up some questions. Thank you. Yeah, that was lovely, Marina. It was nice to hear some stories. So if you have questions for Marina about kingfishers or talking, it's quite a few people know Marina here. Thank you, Marina, for helping me to find my first kingfisher. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> where did you find your kingfisher? Yeah, where was that? <laughs> Maybe right near the <laughs> library, not far. <laughs> I see dippers all the time, but kingfishers, I do not see. So well, they they definitely are in similar places. So <laughs> maybe I'm looking at the water and not looking up. <laughs> hmm. I'll leave it just a couple more minutes here to see if anyone has questions. I'll see a couple. Oh, there we go. The bird in the second to last slide is at the open beak. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you mean, is, the, is that an open beak? That is an yeah. open beak. <laughs> and I think uh, I have this, some access to these amazing photos from this I, photographer in Idaho. And he, he seems to have caught them in ways that show even their tongue, you know, inside, which is unusual. But they do have this this beak that they can open quite wide and that's useful for for snapping down on a fish underwater grasping it hard and it, it's a sharp bill you wouldn't want to be you wouldn't want to have your finger in between those mandibles <laughs> let's see um any theories about the why the female has the colored belt yeah, well, that is something I spent a lot of time pursuing, and there are a number. I'll just mention a couple. One is it could just be a, a signal so that a male would, you know, he's guarding his, his nesting territory, and he knows to welcome her in as his mate versus chasing her away, you know, so it's like a, a, a badge, like, oh, I'm a female, recognize me. That's one theory. Um, there's 
others that I, I find really interesting because I looked at, uh, there's a bird called a phalarope, and that's the, a, a bird that has been very well studied that has this reversal like that of plumage colors. And in that case, with it, the phalarope, the female, and these are birds, we have some here in different species, but anyway, they, all of them have this, this thing. And they, the females that time are very um, aggressive and dominant, and they are with each other too. And they will kind of fight to have their rights to, to the male of their choice. And then they, they tend to mate with more than one male and the male ends up who is much more subdued in coloration actually incubates the eggs and she doesn't at all, but that's an open nest, which is, so it doesn't really apply for the kingfishes since they are underground nesters. However, I started looking at interesting things about dominance and females and they, there's definitely um, some, quite a bit of evidence that show that the females can be very aggressive toward each other and fighting, you know, chasing others away. Um, and what I, one of the things that I thought was intriguing was whether the red belt, the reddish colored belt size and how colorful it, it was might've mattered because in some other birds, you know, the more colorful they are, the more brighter the males, the more, uh, the more they are winners. So I think that's an interesting thing to pursue. And I, um, you could, I looked in my book, I follow that line all the way into the back walls of the Smithsonian, where I looked at all these study skins and compared these very different sizes of belt. So I will say it's an ongoing mystery and it's really one that's fun to, to think about. And uh, I just appreciate that she is wearing the belt. <laughs> I like that. And how did you find your first nest? Oh my gosh, you have to read the book. It was not easy, believe me. It's just like a guessing game and finding the first finding the right you know, earth and bank. And then once you get there, there's all these holes because uh, they're about the size of a tennis ball, squashed tennis ball. And uh, they, you know, over the years, they've made multiple ones. So it's like, this guessing game, you know, like which is the hole that they're going to use, or are they going to do a new one? And then they change their mind and they move. And so I found it on Rattlesnake Creek and it was a, um, it's a big part of the story, finding the hole, losing the hole, losing the birds, finding the birds. Yes. It's not easy to find their nest, but it's very exciting when you do. And then it's not easy to watch them because they're very alert and skittish. And what did they do if their river freezes over? Ah, good question. In in Canada and far north, that's exactly what happens. And those all the birds move south. So the males in that case can't stay. Um, they have to move until they find open water. You're up. That was a very good question. And one thing I, I meant to add too is uh, the males when it, you know they have a clever adaptation. You know, a lot of birds have to adapt to cold in winter. Uh, once they find the open water, they will actually go into holes in their tunnels and then, you know, they, they can extend four or five, six feet back in underground and they have this burrow and of course it's thermoregulated. So they will sometimes go use those holes in the winter at night to find shelter and to have a, uh, a nice comfy temperature compared to being out on a tree limb. So smart. <laughs> Smart birds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, what is your next book project? Oh, thank you. I um, I have more than one idea. I must say. <laughs> so, um, everything from taking my my blogs that I've written over. I, I started uh, writing these essays, short blogs when I was a roving naturalist uh, for a year in between moving from Montana to Oregon. And then I've kept those going. So one idea is to kind of create, put a book of essays together based on them. And then another one is uh, pursuing more bird pursuits, but in uh, connection with ancient forests. Exciting. 
Yeah, you no no rest for the weary. Huh? You go and oh, cover yeah, for your yeah. book, and everyone's like, "What's your next one?" <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I need the motivation. I need to like, come through. <laughs> Now we have a couple other ones. Um, I've seen kingfishers pound a minnow to kill it before swallowing it. Is that true only with larger minnows, or will they swallow uh, small minnows while still alive? Oh, that's a really good question. You know, they almost always do thwack that fish. And but yes, every now and then I have seen them just swallow one with without without knocking it on the branch. So. Uh, it, it does happen. So, and I, there's, and interestingly enough, there's two reasons to hit a fish on a branch. <laughs> and one is to, you know, stun it or kill it. And the other is to break the bones. So by breaking the bones of the fish, it's easier to swallow and digest. And of course they don't have crops. So, you know, they will, when they, when they digest a fish, uh, those bones come out as a pellet so they will eject the pellet of bones through their beak yeah kind of like an owl yes like an owl mm -hmm. and how many chicks do they have and who are their predators oh, i love these questions well classically they have between five and seven chicks in a burrow and they often raise they all get to fledge because you know it's a pretty well protected nest so but the, the danger for the chicks is that first year and they think there's pretty high mortality that you know because they don't have parents protecting them for very long and they have a lot to figure out and learn how to do but the predators um yes they cooper's hawks are definitely one and they well there's been quite i have not seen this but i have a description in the book from someone who watched a king uh, kingfishers being followed by Cooper's hawks and they would actually go into the water and they don't usually submerge, but these were like submerging in the water and coming out to, to evade the Cooper's hawks and uh, that worked. And then goshawk is another one. And then there's a danger to the chicks in the burrow if the hole is too accessible to predators, like a mink could get in or a snake. So those are the main predators, yes. And then uh, fortunately not anymore, but people used to be predators of them too, because back in the 1950s, particularly they were shot and killed by fishermen because they said they were competing with them. So I'm glad we have uh, become a lot better in that, that area. <laughs> I thought it would be because their, uh, their feathers are so beautiful, especially the uh, one in Greece, the common kingfisher. Well, you know, that actually is true, Laurel. I'm glad you mentioned that. That, And, you know, I, I didn't mention that, and, and that's exactly right. And I, I do write about that in the book. Um, they, not so much belted kingfishers now, but there is still a active feather trade um, black market and kingfishers are on that list. And some of them are even involved with this black market fly tying where there's a, um, if anyone, if anyway, if anyway, that you can read more about that in my book too, but there's, yes. And in the past, of course, there was that time when there were crazy, you know, the plume of trade uh, back in the 1900s was terrible. There were so many birds being killed for their plumes, especially egrets and um, kingfishers were among them, yeah. Yeah, the story of that is very interesting. The the fishermen, the high flying. If yeah. You read, about it, read about it or read your book because it's amazing. Um, library. Well, yeah. Is yeah. Awesome. yeah. <laughs> when the fledglings emerge from the nest cave, are they able to catch fish or do you observe a training and parent feeding period? Um, they are not very good at fishing. I have watched them try it and they do really funny belly flops into the water and just like smack down and then they'll like catch like a pine needle or it's just hilarious. And there has been sort of a misnomer that, that's out there that the parents will teach them to fish by dropping things in the water. That's actually not true. Um, there's no real science behind that. But so what I have witnessed and what others have too is that the the parents will feed them fish the first week at least and sometimes longer 
uh, while they're learning. And I think the young ones are just observing, you know, the, the parents and they see them and then it's trial and error and they just slowly get better at it and they do, they figure it out. Well, that's a sink or swim. Yeah, it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the size of a kingfisher egg. What is the size of a kingfisher egg? Oh, it's about the size of a quail egg. And oh, white. It's pretty small. Mm -hmm, pretty small. Yeah. 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 And that's a, a fascinating thing I really got into too, is, you know, just the whole process of hatching and um, they do, you know, hatch all at the same time, you know, some, so it's synchronous hatching. So anyway, it's very, mm. and they're born without any feathers at all. So they're very mm. vulnerable in the nest back in their burrow there. Yeah. And the burrow is unlined, you know, it's just, but they tend to be kind of tidy. Like once they're a little older, they, they will kick their uric acid, you know, kick it into the back and cover it in dirt. And, you know, the burrow is a pretty tidy place. I was always amazed when I watched the male and females, they both equally feed the kingfisher chicks and they'll be inside the, one will be inside the burrow for quite a while. And you know, it's just dirty in there and they come out and they look sparkling clean. Like, how is that even possible? <laughs> so got those good feathers. Well, the questions keep pouring in. Um, oh, I'll just keep asking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what effect is global warming having on kingfisher populations? Um, well, kingfishers are uh, fortunately so far not particularly affected by global warming, except like so many species, there's a lot fewer of them. You know, um, there has been, there's like a million fewer belted kingfishers than there were in the, in you know, back in the 1970s. And this is true for so many birds. Uh, we just don't have the numbers. And I, I think global warming is affecting so many things. I, I do think kingfishers probably Less so, I would say that you know they are um, harbingers, though, and because they're very connected to clean water and to good fishing, and you know, I we don't have that much fresh water, and we know with the changes in drought and with drought, and that is global warming. You know that we have a lot more competition for our water. So in some ways, yes, they are affected and we should listen to them. You know, they're, they're calling us to, to take good care of our, of our waters and our streamside trees too. And I think uh, if we pass the Wild Rivers Act here in the Democracy Act, we will be doing great things for kingfishers in Oregon. And many other species. So, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, have you always been drawn to both science and myth? Yes, I have. As a kid, I loved reading mythology and I, I couldn't get enough of it. Stories and fantasy, Ursula Le Guin, you know, all those things. And then, yes, I grew up with a bird loving father and um, he's part of this book too, is sort of processing the loss of my father. And, um, but, you know, I was always around nature and birds growing up. So, and then uh, I, yeah, so I, I think the two do come, go together really well. And I also, I love stories where uh, whenever somebody was turned into a bird, I was just like, oh, I want to see that. I want to be that. <laughs> Well, it's very fitting. I think we could end on that note with the <laughs> transformation of your thoughts into a book about a bird. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I hope everyone enjoys it and I uh, and order the book and, and I will be excited when it comes out to be able to give some readings and go on some tour. Hope fingers crossed with COVID that that will be possible. Yeah, we do have Marilyn, uh, Marina at, uh, for some of our uh, programs in March as well. So please yes. check Birds that out on our calendar. Yeah. Beyond the Kingfisher. We yeah. might talk yeah. about puffins too. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> thank you so much, Marina. This has been a Thanks lovely evening. And thank Thanks you for everyone. all of you in the audience. Bye. Bye.